This is the Monday, November 21st, 2016 episode of The History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. By now, you're familiar with our theme song, New York Ain't New York Anymore, as performed by Dixie Stars in 1925. In it, Dixie describes the places that the gang used to meet and the things they used to do before the Great War changed their city forever. But what if we could step out of our time machine to visit Sherry's and and Murray's and and Rexton's, you know, the Claridge and Church Hills and Delmonico. We'd look around at the places, sure. And we talk to the people. But what about the things? The everyday items like subway tokens and the pink orbs used for stickball in the Borough Beautiful of Brooklyn. What if we could go back even further to watch the signatures to the Flushing Remonstrance, a 1657 petition for religious freedom that was a precursor to Jefferson's Virginia statute for religious freedom and the First Amendment's protection of religious liberty. This week, Sam Roberts takes us on just such a journey. The book is... A History of New York in 101 Objects. Mr. Roberts is urban affairs correspondent for the New York Times, having written for the Gray Lady since 1993. He's also the host of the New York Times Close-Up on New York One. You can read his columns in the paper or online, and you can follow his thoughts at SamRob12 on Twitter. You can also check out his eight previous titles, including Grand Central, How a Train Station Transformed America. Okay, now that we've hitched a U-Haul to our time machine, let's meet Sam Roberts and explore A History of New York in 101 Objects. New York ain't New York anymore. I'm joined on the line by New York Times columnist Sam Roberts to chat about his latest book, A History of New York in 101 Objects. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Dean, I'm delighted. Thank you for having me. How are you? I I burned a bagel. So. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. It's not a good way to start the day. <laughs> no, I, I jotted it down and I said, maybe that's one of the criteria for being one of the 101 things, especially food, <laughs> that if you burn it, you have this existential crisis. And you just feel like you really let down the city. Exactly. Now we only have a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you choose these things? Editing is always a challenge. Whether you limit yourself to 101 words or 101 objects, walk us through your process of making each of these objects earn their spot in your book. Well, I started off with a number of criteria and kind of whittled it down from that. I was looking for objects that were transformative or emblematic of some sort of transformation. I wanted objects that were provocative rather than predictable ones, not something like the Empire State Building or something that was clearly identifiable with New York, but things that would make people think about New York, people would think about history in a different kind of way. I was looking for objects that would be enduring, that you would be able to pick up this book 5, 10, 50 years from now and say, you know, that was pretty smart of including that object. It's not something that faded with time. It is still of some significance. I wanted objects that weren't kind of bigger than a bread box. I cheated on a couple, I admit, but things that weren't so enormous that they were there in plain sight. I wanted things that weren't living human beings. A number of people uh, suggested former Mayor Ed Koch and other personalities like that, but I sort of ruled them out. And as you said with the bagel, given all these suggestions I had, I did not want 
all of the objects to be about food. <laughs> it was absolutely remarkable the number of people who suggested to me uh, items of food in one category or another, from pizza to egg creams to empanadas to bagels, of course. Someone suggested at one point that given the decline in crime in New York, that perhaps we should change the city's motto to leave the gun and take the cannoli, because <laughs> that's what uh, New York seemed to become all about. Yeah, the food is so many things. I'm sitting here rooting for the knish, for instance. Well, that's right. And <laughs> well, the bagels seem to be, you know, very much of a New York thing. And I have to admit, uh, one of the foods that I did include, and this was author's prerogative, was a black and white cookie. Your favorite. You know, you, my favorite, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, I think that the good thing about the bagel is their circles. You know, you look in that bagel hole, it, it combines everything. So we can sort of fudge a little bit there and talk ourselves into it. And that's right. And something like pizza, Dean, uh, which a lot of people suggested, I didn't think was a uniquely New York food. I mean, pizza is certainly famous in Chicago and other places around the country, and of course, in Italy as well. And while pizza is more than readily accessible in New York in every sort of form, I didn't think it was that identifiable with New York per se, where certainly a bagel, which has become ubiquitous around the country, and around the world is much more identifiable as a New York icon. One of my tests would be with the food is if you go to somewhere today, especially where you can have anything shipped and there's restaurants all over, I've brought bagels to friends in Los Angeles, friends in North Carolina, all over. The first thing somebody wants when they come back to New York, if they've moved away for school or a job, is a bagel. That's right. Uh, I've taken them to Norway when I visit my friend in Norway. Everybody says, sneak a bagel on. And then they always have their family members that are not even from here or friends that want to get a hold of one. So I saw that when I looked at the cover, I said, that's got to be a criteria for the bagel is that it's something that, as you said, ubiquitous. We see it all the time. And yet you go somewhere else and you order a bagel and you say, this is a roll. This is not a New York bagel. Exactly. You want a good New York boiled bagel with a schmear as they say, of cream cheese and a little bit of lock. I'm so sad over burning that one now. You made it even sad. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I have to have somebody do it for me, I guess. I've lost my card for the week. But Theodore Roosevelt is our only president born in New York City, ran for mayor. He wrote in his autobiography, quote, I have no sympathy whatever with writing lists of the 100 best books, unquote. And I thought of that for A History of New York in 101 Objects because you say a history, not the history. What did you learn about your own point of view other than you have this love affair with the black and white cookie as you compiled the list? Well, Dean, one of the things I wanted to make clear when I did this book is that it's not even a history, it's my history. And what I wanted readers to do and encourage them to do is come up with their own list. As I say, let the parlor game begin. Uh, half the fun of reading this book is people coming up with their own lists and saying, well, why do you include that? You didn't include the other thing. One of the things I left out when I originally did the story for the New York Times was the subway token. I thought, that was just too obvious. And boy, did I hear from readers saying, <laughs> how could you ever possibly do that? And what I learned is that history obviously is very subjective. We each approach it very differently. Uh, they say history is written by the winners, if you will. I remember the Alan Bennett play, The History Boys. And one of the kids in this class is asked to define history. And he stops and thinks for a minute and he says, more or less, well, history is just one damn thing after another. Well, that's one definition. Uh, history can be a chronology. It can be a road recitation of events. I tried in this book to make it a lot more interesting to look at three-dimensional objects, uh, sort of inspired by the British Museum series on, on objects. And one of the reasons that objects, I think, are more interesting is that they offer authenticity in a virtual world. Uh, they offer a certain degree of tangibility in a digital world. The ordinary things in a very materialistic world turn out to be valuable. Uh, things that we ordinarily take for granted take on an added value 
And I think that's fascinating. Uh, you, you know, they don't have to be diamonds. They don't have to be gems. They don't have to be great masterpiece paintings. And yet they still can have an enormous intrinsic value that we ordinarily wouldn't attribute to them. It reminds me of Philip K. Dick, the dialogue in The Man in the High Castle, which is now an Amazon series. One of the characters deals in antiques, and he says, here's two lighters. One of them belonged to Hirohito or wherever it happens to be. This other one's just a very good copy. They're almost identical. So other than one being a copy, what is it that makes this one valuable and worthy of being in a museum? It's historicity, I think, is the word that he uses for it. But these things have that. And when you travel away, that's certainly something you see when they used to have the cup, the Greek columns, the coffee cup. That's right. The anthora. Or the, right. Right. When you first go somewhere and you're getting coffee just in a regular cup, you start to notice that that's a difference. Or when you have a guest come to the city and we go to all the places we never go as people who live here, they notice it and they say, wow, that that's just like a movie. And you say, well, it's my coffee cup. It's not. <laughs> you see through somebody else's eyes. And I love the idea that you opened it up to argument because it's another thing that we love to do. We have this great thing where we say, I'm just saying, I was interviewing Lynn Schur uh, for her biography on Sally Ride. And when I listened to it, I noticed we both said, I'm just saying in response to each other, meaning completely different things. And yet it was the same phrase. And I had a friend from Australia who came here. And he said, I just love that. It's like the editorial voice. You could say whatever you want. You invited people to have this conversation with you in picking these things. Somebody who maybe didn't know what the oyster was. I, I love the inclusion of the oyster. Some people might not have even gotten that. And that's part of it. You got to argue with people and explain to them maybe history they didn't even know. Well, argue with them and also, frankly, learn from them because I included a lot of objects that people suggested. And the book is filled with things, frankly, that I learned. One of the great things about my job is the time sort of provides me with a daily postgraduate education. I keep learning things about the city uh, through objects, through other things, and through people suggesting things to me. A lot of these things I hadn't thought of myself. And thanks to readers, I I was educated as well. Like what things? A whole bunch of things that some people suggested. The Spalding, you know, or Spalding, as it's officially known, the ball, which was sort of so obvious I hadn't thought of. And it's just absolutely natural. It is the fundamental tool of the outdoor game in New York, the street game in New York. And there it is. I hadn't thought of it. And about 10 people wrote in uh, email or otherwise and said, you know, how can you leave out the Spalding, as we call it in New York? And sure enough, there it is in the book. I noticed that. And the first thing I did was call Jeff Griffin, who's another author that I interviewed. He wrote a book called Brooklyn Bat Boy. It's about Jackie Robinson's first year with the Dodgers. And when I read his his book, and he mentioned it, he said, kids just love that and they wanted to go get one. And that's from the days of using the pothole as first base and the sewer grade as home plate and that kind of things. So it involves people. It's not just that these are objects, things you look at in a museum. These are things that you use and that you can hold. I, I thought that that was a great one to include. Well, that's right. You hold that and it has a certain feeling to it and it brings back memories to it. And it is that tangible sense of interpreting history. Now at colleges, they call it material culture. But to us, it is is what I like to, when I describe this to people when I'm talking about the book, it's sort of a rosebud moment from the Citizen Kane film. What is it in your life? What object in your life brings back those memories? What is it that becomes a defining moment? It could be a high school pin or a medal or favorite doll or an award or a grandchild's first tooth or anything like that. You know, if you had to pick one object in your life that really defined it or was transformative. And when you go back in history, whether it's New York history or American history or world history, you kind of can look for the same things and find them too. And, you know, they don't have to be a definitive list of 101 or any other arbitrary number, but it's fascinating to look at objects and see history through that lens. It's natural that we would look at the things we remember, like the Spalding, like we're able to run out and get a bagel. 
But the city we know as New York City today, Greater New York, since consolidation with the outer boroughs on New Year's Day, 1898, it was previously Dutch New Amsterdam and sort of clustered there at the end of Manhattan Island. Before that, it was the domain of native tribes like the Canarsie, a lot of these great names that we still have around that maybe we forget they came from actual people that are no longer here. Describe how you avoided that tendency to focus on objects too close to the present. Maybe this was something that readers helped you with when you wanted to really get the broad scope of the city. Well, they did, Dean. And one of the things, as I said early on, one of those criteria was to look at things that were and would be enduring. There's a tendency to look at things that we see around us today. And what I wanted to do was go back and look at the history of New York and look at its importance in the history of the country. And Ken Jackson, the Columbia University professor, likes to say America begins in New York. And that's something that we as New Yorkers really don't think much about. And you stop to realize that places as important as they are, like Boston, Philadelphia, Jamestown, have in a sense hijacked American history. A lot happened in New York. And New York was distinct from every other settlement, every other European settlement in the 17th century, the 18th century. And it was distinct because the Dutch instilled a spirit of, well, you know, in the best sense, we can call it tolerance. In the most cynical sense, we can call it indifference. But they didn't come here to proselytize. They didn't come here to escape religious persecution. They came here to make money. And if you didn't interfere with that money making, you were pretty much accepted. And that tolerance, if you will, pretty much defined the rest of America, and it carried over to what America was like to the rest of the world. And as this book demonstrates, New York is where freedom of religion in the Flushing Remonstrance, where freedom of the press in the Zenger trial were codified decades or more before the Bill of Rights. It was where the first capital of the United States was. The first Congress was where Washington was inaugurated at what's now Federal Hall. So in a sense, America does begin in New York. And therefore, I wasn't really concerned that I learned a lot about this, that the book would become too provincial. It really magnifies the importance of New York in American history. I found so many of those things, when you say a history, it has to be more than just a thing we happen to have here, like bagels, for instance, or those Chinese food containers. My wife first came from Canada and saw one of those. She just said, again, it's like a movie. It looks like, I said, what do they do in Canada? They just knock on your door and you hold out your bowl. I just assumed everyone had those little white containers. But another item was the water towers that we have on top of buildings, the water tanks. And I was reading one review of A History of New York and 101 Objects, and the man was explaining how they're built and how they go together. And I thought Coopers, people who put together barrels, they would have understood completely. It's the same principle. The water makes the wood warp, as anyone who's had a leak on a hardwood floor knows, and it seals all of those openings that might be there, all the gaps, and it holds water just fine. And when you talk about the bagel, certainly if you explain to somebody who just landed here from Mars what the bagel is, well, it's a gateway to all of the Jewish history. The first immigrants, the museum at Eldridge Street that's now in the middle of Chinatown, they have their annual egg cream and egg roll festival every year. example of this tolerance and melting pot that you talked about. So you really were able to use these not just as a list of things, but each one had to have a story to tell. It had to really sit down with you. That's exactly right. And when you look at the water towers, what it says is a lot about the city's water supply. One of the reasons we had so many buildings that only went up to six stories is that most of the water supply in the city is fed by gravity. And that gravity coming from the uh, Catskills, coming from Westchester, could only go up to about the sixth floor of a building. So they had to pump the water up higher and let it flow down by gravity from skyscrapers, from taller buildings, hence those wooden water tanks, which, believe it or not, in the 21st century, in new major state-of-the-art buildings are still being used in 
many cases as the best available system. We have high pressure pumps, we have stainless steel tanks, we have other innovations, but many new buildings are still using those wooden water tanks. Easy to assemble, long lasting, don't change the taste of the water. And there they are after a hundred years. And there are three companies that have been in business for more than a century that are making and servicing those tanks. You say that they can put one up in 24 hours, which seems incredible, and they last 30 years. That's right. They can put it up in 24 hours. They can get those staves of wood up in an elevator easily enough. And as you say, once you fill them with water, the the wood swells and they become watertight. And it's a fascinating system. And there they are decorating the roofs of buildings. And there's even one that has been immortalized in the Museum of Modern Art. My guest is author Sam Roberts, and his book is A History of New York in 101 Objects. You can find his column in the New York Times or follow him at SamRob12 on Twitter. Marty Markowitz, former borough president of Brooklyn, writes, quote, Sam Roberts' History of New York in 101 Objects is the best thing to happen to New York since Nathan's Hot Dogs and Junior's Cheesecake, unquote. Note he picked two things from Brooklyn there, which I thought was telling. That's a good politician for you. Indeed, a good promoter of the borough. Right. And Junior's, again, I'll cite my wife coming from Canada. It's hard. It's, there's no taste to it. This is New York cheesecake. Well, you know, now, of course, we do the thing where, well, hey, do you want half? And you order it and, you know, you take a couple of forkfuls, you end up fighting over it. I think that's a good, they should teach you that in marriage counseling. I don't, maybe they do. I don't know. But. That's right. To order two pieces. <laughs> right. It's just always so good. It's so different. It does tell you something because that's really a gateway to all that other food that you talked about. Because our food matters to us. It does. You sort of are what you eat in New York. And the ethnic food, the blending of food, when you talk about a melting pot, you know, as Pat Moynihan and Nat Glazer wrote years ago, we are beyond a melting pot. We really haven't really melted ethnically. And one of the things I left out of the book, one of the many things there was no room for, I wanted to run, run the original program of that melting pot play, Israel Zangwill's play from which the term comes. But in terms of food, you know, you walk along the street and you look at the carts that are available for lunch and and you go through Flushing in Queens and along the number seven subway line. And you can get every kind of available food in the world in New York City. And that's a reflection of the great immigrant flow that has come to this city in wave after wave. And that is just in the past 20, 30 years revitalized the city so that we now have a record just reported by the census, a record population that surpassed 8.5 million and growing uh, constantly. And as for the food, if you'd written A History of New York in 101 Objects in, say, 1917, which is just a year after Nathan Handwerker and his wife Ida opened their stand on Coney Island, they wouldn't have been a symbol of the city yet. And maybe you would have just thought, well, this is a really good hot dog. I hope these two kids make it out here. Do you think there are any general rules for items that you can impart to people? Because I'm sure people now assume, well, you know what the next big thing is. They'll be coming to you forever and saying, well, what do you think? Is this a fad or is this going to be something that's going to be an icon of the city in 100 years? What is it that makes you look at something new and say that's going to have staying power? Well, that's a very good question. And again, one of the criteria was that they be enduring. And it's a little hard to tell now, you know, when you look at an invention right now, what is going to be enduring, especially the pace at which technology is developing these days. But it was fascinating to look at things that had an effect on the city and things that you wouldn't ordinarily expect. And one of them was Elisha Otis's elevator safety break. Now, we've had elevators since ancient times. The one problem with them was a lot of them didn't work. Well, he developed a safety break. He demonstrated it in the old Crystal Palace, which was where Brian Park is today. He went up it with P.T. Barnum demonstrating it went up in this elevator to the top of the Crystal Palace and with a big kind of pruning shears and cut the cable and the crowd gasped <laughs> and the elevator cab actually fell a few feet 
And Otis said, no, no, don't worry. And then the elevator stopped and it was safe. And the fact that he had developed a safety brake that stopped the elevator from falling meant that we could build the skyscrapers that we have in New York today. So that one patented device, which is one of the objects in the book, meant that we could have skyscrapers. Now, at the time, if you looked at that patent drawing, would you say that is going to become one of the 101 objects that defined the history of New York? Maybe, maybe not. But the fact that it worked and led to the construction of skyscrapers, well, it turned out to be. Another one was the air conditioner. Well, you know, we might have guessed that it would have some impact. More people would go to theaters. More people would be able to shop in department stores. But one of the impacts of the air conditioner was a massive demographic change. It opened up the south and the southwest of the United States to a major demographic shift. And that shift tipped the political balance of this country away from New York and other northeastern cities. You look at things like the congressional delegation, the electoral vote in New York and how that has changed. And, you know, it's been an enormous effect. And I've got to say, you know, we can exaggerate that importance a little bit, but without air conditioning, many of those people would not have moved south. And therefore, you know, the air conditioner had a monumental effect that we might not have envisioned at the time in terms of that kind of impact. There's a ticket to the Third Avenue trolley in the book as one of the objects. Well, you know, I don't think anybody would have said this is going to be an enduring object that was transformative in the city. But that ticket, a ticket, was used by a woman named Elizabeth Jennings to get on the trolley in the Bowery in 1850s, early 1850s. She was going to church. She was a black woman, and she was thrown off the trolley because it was a whites-only trolley. And she sued. She hired a young lawyer named Chester Arthur. Arthur later became president of the United States. She won her case in Brooklyn Supreme Court. And the judge said, you can't throw a woman off the trolley just because she's black. You can't deny public transportation to someone just because of race. This was 100 years before Rosa Parks. So that ticket became emblematic of something that was transformative. And, you know, the lesson from that also is that nobody knows about that case. And therefore, it gives us the opportunity to learn history in a different way. Well, I'm a big fan of Chester A. Arthur. I always stop by and say hello to his statue that we have in Madison Square Park, his inaugural site. He was an accidental president. He became president when James A. Garfield died. But we have Arthur Avenue in the city named for him and also a group of high school students with their teacher named a corner for Ms. Jennings. And you're right. It's a huge moment. And I saw that ticket. I thought it was just about the trolleys and about transportations, but it symbolizes a story. And then it opens up this whole thing where you learn about a little bit about Arthur, who's kind of forgotten. There's a big portrait of him in McSorley's old alehouse, by the way. And right. somebody said to me one day, was, so he was just kind of a do-nothing president, huh? And it was one of those very early days at McSorley's. And they said, by the time I finished going on about Arthur, they said, you notice everybody was listening <laughs> on the other tables? And I said, oh, well, that's nice, you know, because we forget these people, but they were real and they did change the way we live. And there's another thing about Arthur, too, Dean. We know Federal Hall is the site of George Washington's inauguration, but there is a building on Lexington Avenue that is the only building in New York City where a president was actually inaugurated, and that was Chester Arthur. The building is now an Indian spice market, which once again shows how much we discard our history, but that is the only site in New York City where a president was actually inaugurated. There's a plaque, and even the historical association that put up the plaque there for Arthur's inaugural site is no longer in existence. So that's that shows right. you how fast. And the uh, <laughs> plaque is in the lobby, and you need a key to get in. <laughs> 
You chose two shoes to mark the paddle boat General Slocum disaster. Another park in Manhattan, Tompkins Square Park. There's sort of a little noticed memorial there to the people that died. Mostly forgotten today, but when she caught fire and beached on North Brother Island, it was the worst loss of life in the city until 9-11. And I wondered, why not a life vest, say? The life vests were infamously, the cork had all disintegrated. It was sand would weigh people down that jumped in the water or a scorched board. Why shoes to mark that tragedy? Well, Dean, it could have been one of those things. But the reason I included the General Slocum was, A, as you said, it was a major tragedy in the city's history. But it wasn't just a tragedy. It also precipitated a big demographic change. A lot of the people who were affected by that tragedy, German-Americans who lived on the Lower East Side, were so struck by it that they actually, the survivors, their families actually moved out of the neighborhood, actually shifted the population to Queens and other parts of the city because they were so mesmerized, they were so struck by it that they just had to move away. And the reason I picked shoes is because they were so evocative. They made you think for a moment rather than a photograph of the boat or rather than some other artifact. They made you think who was wearing those shoes. And we actually know the little girl who those shoes belong to. And you stop and think of what she might have grown up to be and and who she might have grown up to be if she hadn't died in that disaster. And I was looking for objects in the book that would be evocative, just like when I wanted to find something that was emblematic of the World Trade Center attack in 2001. I could have used a twisted girder. I could have used a photograph of the Twin Towers. But what I eventually landed on was a jar of dust that was collected in Lower Manhattan on that very day. Now, I don't know what's in that jar of dust. In fact, I don't want to know what's in it. But it sure does make you think about what happened that day and its consequences and its aftermath in a way that I think something obvious and something much more concrete would not do. And again, that's the whole purpose of the book, to make people think about history in a different way. You write in the book itself, A History of New York and 101 Objects. Your goal was to be provocative, to be evocative, certainly to get people thinking a jar of ash and think about it. (laughs) It can literally be everything and yet it's nothing. The book is in paperback now, so it's been out for a while in hardcover. How well did you succeed? Is it surprising you the responses you're getting from people or is it about what you hope for? Well, I'll tell you, if there's one measure of how evocative and provocative it's been, it's been the response of readers, both people I run into when I talk about the book and emails I receive. And I think it has worked its magic, if you will, because people are responding, saying, why did you ever include that item? Why did you include that object? And, you know, I've got a million better ones, and then they suggest them. And frankly, some of them are good. Again, the challenge has been winnowing them down to 101. In fact, if anything, you know, I might do another volume because there are more than 101 more objects that were transformative in New York's history that might be worth focusing on. There's so many fascinating things that become symbolic of the city in terms of all sorts of categories. You could do 101 foods. You could do 101 ethnic items that immigrants have brought with them, all sorts of things like that, that people identify with. So I think in terms of the public reaction, readers' reaction, if that is the best measure of how successful the book has been, I'd say it's been very successful. You do go back, as we mentioned, to the very first human inhabitants of the island of Manhattan and the surrounding areas that make up Greater New York. That leads to a comment you cite by Neil McGregor, director of the British Museum. He says, quote, a history through objects can never itself be fully balanced because it depends entirely on what happens to survive. There's only a single object on your list that doesn't exist that we can't hold in our hands, as we talked about. 
If you could climb in a time machine, though, and collect any object in the long history of the city to bring back to us and sort of hold over your head there like the Lion King. In fact, we could do it at the Lion King Theater. Hmm. But what object do you think that would be? Would you choose that ball that's the missing object or something else entirely? Well, that one object that we couldn't find that is an object of mystery is the baseball that Bobby Thompson hit to capture the National League pennant beating the Brooklyn Dodgers. The bat is there, but not the ball. So if we ever found the ball, not only would it be worth a lot, but I would certainly use my time machine to include that. If I could find anything else with a time machine, hmm, let me think. Uh, Well, it would be... It would be whatever document there was, if it existed, that Peter Minui used to purchase Manhattan Island. One of the things in the book is a letter to the Dutch West India Company that refers to the purchase of Manhattan Island. It's a letter from Peter Skahagen, a uh, merchant uh, writing to the Dutch West India Company in 1625, saying he's just on his way back from the new colony of New Amsterdam, talking about the summer there, saying that there was a pretty good crop they raised, that he's bringing back some beaver and otter pelts. A number of kids were born over the summer. And by the way, we bought Manhattan Island. Now, if anything qualifies for the city's birth certificate, I'd say it's that. Now, the Indians might not have thought they had sold Manhattan Island, but according to the Dutch, they had bought it. And if there were any document that constituted a bill of sale, boy, would I love to find that. (laughs) <laughs> that was involved the Canarsie, too. I believe there was two sales. They first purchased it, and then they discovered that the people they bought it from, it sort of scammed them. So it was the city's first real estate scam. Exactly. I'm not sure the people who sold it really owned it. Uh, and of course, that was the famous $24, 60 or so guilders that was later translated into $24, which certainly has got to be the best real estate bargain in history. Till the Bugs Bunny sold it back, if you remember that, speaking of Brooklyn and the Dodgers. <laughs> no. They wouldn't take it till I threw in a set of dishes, he says. That's right. <laughs> you write in A History of New York and 101 Objects that History isn't really about the past, but about who we are right now as a society, just as an obituary is about life, the life that has just been lived. Did you see the same picture that you hoped to paint or that you thought you'd have, or did you let the objects take you somewhere new? And as an aside, if you could get that baseball, what would you have to bump from the list? Well, that's a good question. There were 101 objects in the book. I'm not sure what I would bump. It's very difficult. Whenever, you know, frankly, anyone uh, comes up to me and makes a suggestion, I say, well, that would have been the 102nd object. It's hard to imagine what I would leave off. Again, it's a very subjective list. You could include anything. You could leave anything off. One of the things that's fascinating, though, is as you sort of alluded to earlier, is that people tend to pick things that are much more current so that when the Smithsonian not long ago asked people to pick the most iconic object in its collection, they left out all sorts of things like Francis Scott Key's original text of the National Anthem, Gilbert Stewart painting of George Washington, and they chose uh, a baby panda that had just been born at the National Zoo. Now, no doubt the panda bear was the cutest object, but 50 years from now, I doubt it will be remembered as the most iconic. So again, if we have to factor in all of those criteria of things that were transformative, things that were enduring, things that we will look back on in a couple of decades and say these were distinctive and characteristic and had an impact in ways that we couldn't have imagined and are provocative and not predictable. So I think many of those I chose uh, are in that category. Something like the mechanical cotton picker. Now, why a mechanical cotton picker in a book about New York? Uh, Just try and find the mechanical cotton picker in New York. Well, the reason I picked that is because the mechanical cotton picker in the late 40s freed blacks from an agrarian economy in the South. And that was one of the demographic changes, one of the demographic 
demographic upheavals that changed the population structure of places like New York, which had a profound effect on the city and its social and economic and ultimately political structure. So that, again, is the kind of thing that you wouldn't ordinarily look to, you wouldn't find in the city itself, and yet was an object that had a major impact on New York City. It's things that are going to help you tell the story. That's the key thing, not just 101, even iconic things. It's things that help tell the history. Right. That's the premise. I think maybe it gets lost when we see 101. For instance, of all the signs in the city, many of them are iconic. Everybody's seen Highlander, I would think. So you're thinking of sword fights, that Pepsi sign has to be in there, things like that people might want. But you chose the Domino Sugar sign. Of all the <laughs> signs, why did you choose that? Well, uh, because I wanted to remind people that New York was a big manufacturing city. There could have been the Pepsi sign, the Silver Cup Bread sign, but people forget that at one point, half the sugar in the United States was processed at that domino plant in New York City on the Brooklyn waterfront. The city still manufactures lots of things from pianos to the landing gear of spacecraft, but I thought that was an important emblem, if you will, of the role of manufacturing manufacturing in this city. And there it is still, you know, it's taken down briefly while they're renovating the site. But there it is still now as sort of a monument to manufacturing and the role that it's played in New York. People forget that in the 19th century, the early 20th century, New York was really a center of manufacturing. The Brooklyn Navy Yard, things like that, and played a vital part in the city's economy. And of course, the port of New York, which is how New York actually actually began the Erie Canal, the river of empire that exported not only goods to and from New York, but the culture and politics of New York. And it made a president. That's where Chester Arthur got his start in a patronage job. Running Indeed, the that's right. Port of New York. <laughs> As the head of customs. Well, I could ask 101 questions, but this will be my last. It's that your book, Like the City, is an ongoing conversation. You set up an email address, objectsofmyc at gmail.com. How long will readers be able to write to you there to lobby for their favorite historical objects or rail against the ones they don't like? Uh, as long as I can uh, keep my attention span, which uh, is a long time because I'm a very curious person and will keep looking for more and more objects, keep adding them to my list. So I welcome uh, any readers who and listeners to your program who want to send in some suggestions. The more objects, the better. Well, Sam Roberts of The New York Times, author of A History of New York in 101 Objects, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for making me look a little bit better at that bagel. Even though it's burned, it's still a New York City bagel. <laughs> I hope you have great luck with the book, and I look forward to the next 101. Dean, thank you so much. Again, the book is A History of New York in 101 Objects. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. Or even bookmark the URL of our homepage for all your online purchases. Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of everything you spend at no additional cost to you. Once again, thank you to Sam Roberts for joining us and for giving us his view of Gotham by making the objects, documents, and even a few places, speak to us through the centuries. You can catch his columns in the New York Times and follow him at SamRob12 on Twitter. That address again to email him your thoughts on his list or to pitch your own historic items for the next book is objectsofmyc at gmail.com. And speaking of the great New York City conversation, you can always let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash history author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And remember, if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. I'm just saying, it would be a nice thing to do. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. Standing alone, I saw Georgie Cone somewhere on Long Acre Square. 
crowds passed him by, I heard Georgie sigh, nobody noticed him there. I asked him why he didn't smile, he said in that old Cohen style, Oh, New York ain't New York anymore, how I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor, where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before, there are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. I remember, he said, when I first hit Broadway, New York was New York and the white way was gay. There were Sherry's and Murray's and Rector's, you know, the Claridge and Churchill's and Delmonico. Music and laughter, and the prices were right. A ten dollar bill meant a wonderful night. And then came the day Broadway wasn't prepared When the newsboys yelled extra, war is declared But the hand that held glasses of wine in the air Were the first to hold guns when I rode over there The boys won the war and came home from the fight The last night on Broadway was almost his night but ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to be. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Yeah, they wouldn't take it until I threw in a set of dishes. <laughs>